spaghetti andiamo so welcome everybody so we have Irki with us from Spotify thank you hey. Hey. hello everyone uh, the room is kind of packed so for once but before you actually run out when you hear what I'm talking about or uh, I'll just grab a photo it's a landscape mode it's a hard thing to do yeah it's actually can't fit oh uh, well there nice uh, so welcome everyone uh, the topic for the talk as you can see on the screen, uh, is taming pythons with Zookeeper. But before we dive a bit deeper into that one, uh, let me tell you a, fine, uh, like a few things about myself. So, uh, as Alan said, my name is uh, Jurke Pullinen. In the interwebs, I go with the handle Nailor. Uh, you can find me in Twitter, GitHub, pretty much any weird social thingy. I, probably, uh, I will probably be there with that handle. And if you want to send me mail, you can contact, uh, contact me uh, with uh, Jurke at Spotify.com. So, yeah, I work in this uh, music streaming company called Spotify. Uh, we'll get back to it later in the talk. I assume most of the people here probably know what it is, but it's not the key essence for this talk. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, I work as a, I like to con uh, describe myself as a content engineer. So. What that means is that in my day-to-day -day job, I will get gigabytes of audio and so big and so complicated XML documents that you can only dream of from the labels. I will look into those, put them in a database, mangle them a bit, and then comes the fun part, which is uh, from this around 700 gigs of uh, data in Postgres, we build a lot of indices. And fiddling around with those indices is uh, nice pro process and then when we're done with them we push them to somewhat somewhere around 200 hosts nowadays i'm not completely sure about about the amount of the four different data centers it's not like a google scale but it's kind of big ish thingy and uh, that has uh, caused a lot of issues for us uh, especially like how you handle concurrency uh, how you handle consistency in those systems and so forth so about a year ago, we found this tool called Zookeeper. After, of course, going through, yeah, uh, after of course going through the traditional engineering way, which was which was like, yeah, we need to figure out how to handle consistency, concurrency, and so forth. So we, pro yeah, let's write our own tool. You know, gossip protocols, Paxos. Yeah, we can do this. Like, write our own tool. But of course, you know, why you're a perfectly good engineer? Why wouldn't you write your own tool? Uh, I'm extremely glad that I had this one Italian guy in my team who slapped me in the face and like you look look like there's a zookeeper, there's a tool called zookeeper, it does what you need. You don't start writing your own stuff from the scratch. So that said, I have a slight disclaimer here. I've been using zookeeper for only a year, so I in no way I'm claiming to be an expert on it. I've gone through like the the rock bottom with it and might might be knowing something on it about it now. The other disclaimer is that this is a Python conference and I am lecturing you about the Java software. So please don't stone me to death. I will get to the Python parts later on. And uh, even though you know it would be nice to have a Python tool to do this stuff, uh, so far this is one the best one I have actually found. So uh, let's start with a slight questionnaire. Who here has heard about Zookeeper? Nice. Uh, this here is an iOS game called Zookeeper. Which one of you guys would just raise your hand, raise your hand for this one? None? Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, we actually have a product owner who's really damn good in this game. For the actual Zookeeper, uh, he lets us do our job, but he's really damn good in this game. And like when we started working the pro process, uh, on this project, he actually posted these mails on our mailing list, mailing list at 2 a.m. with like a screenshot from his iOS device, like iPhone with a new high score. Guys, I'm better in Zookeeper than you are. Uh, anyway, we are not here to talk about this one. We're here to talk about what's called the Apache Zookeeper. It's, uh, as I said, it's a Java. Thing, monolithic as the Java things 
are, are supposed to be. Uh, it's uh, developed by Yahoo in 2007. Uh, the issue Yahoo went for to solve with the Zookeeper was that they wanted to find a tool that they could actually use to, like, when you run a lot of Hadoop jobs or what whatnot in your pipe, you want to have some sort of control, like signaling that something is working or something, so that nothing else picks it up. So locks and that kind of stuff. So they came up with Zookeeper. They did it in 2007, and since then, uh, I don't, I, I didn't actually find it. I tried to find it, but since then, it has. Uh, entered under the Apache umbrella and it's open source Apache license and so forth. But I didn't, I couldn't find the year when it actually happened, which is a kind of shame. So, what is it, what is it then? Uh, it is a kind of like an in-memory database, or maybe share like a maybe a shared file system, a network file system, but it's really neither of them. So the way it stores data, uh, it can be viewed as a file system. So it's like a, a tree-like data structure, like tri as tree, T-R-I-E, like a data structure where you have nodes that have children, that have children, and so forth. It kind of looks like file system. You access it with like a slash, something, slash, something. But the difference with most file systems and Zookeeper is that you can actually store data on the actual directories. Uh, it's also not meant to be used as a file system. Uh, the maximum amount of data per node you can actually store into it is only one megabyte. I wouldn't go beyond tens of kilobytes in any case because it's not really meant for that. Uh, but it also guarantees you like uh, hard consistency and partition tolerance. So if you know the famous cap theorem, it actually sacrifices availability. So if you use Zookeeper, you store your data into that one, you can be pretty sure that it, once you write it there, it actually is consistent. It's, it's actually in that point when you get the reply back, it's already been written to at least the quorum of nodes, which means over the half. So let's say you have three nodes, it means that at least two nodes have it written down all the way under the disk. And and if that won't succeed, then it won't just, you know, then it will tell you, sorry, can't do. Uh, and if you can connect to it, you can be pretty sure that you're talking with the majority of the nodes and so forth. Uh, it's also uh, run in memory, as I said. So that makes it possible that when you query it with the client, you can just connect to any node in the Zookeeper cluster, ask the data, and if the client has it in memory, it will respond it quickly uh, from, the, from there in memory view of data. Of course, uh, if you are really, if you really want to know if it's the latest data, you can also pass a flag and like make it query the actual master server. So, uh, to describe the Zookeeper, the Zookeeper wiki actually has a pretty nice thing. Uh, it's called the Tao Zookeeper. I think they saw our send of Python and like, oh, we can make better. So they picked up the Tao, Tao Zookeeper. It's, uh, it's five things. So they describe uh, uh, the zookeepers that the zookeepers keep order. So if you think about the zoo analogy, uh, the idea of the zookeeper is that the baboon stays in the cage, the human stays outside, preferably. Uh, in some cases, the human might need to go into the cage and attend the baboon a bit, but like most of the time, they keep order that things, things belong where they are supposed to go. And if you need to feed baboon first, then you feed baboon first, and then you go for the parrot, parrots after that. So the zookeeper cluster guarantees you that whatever operations you run on, onto it, it will keep an order, and that order is shared between all the nodes. So if I add a node, and I delete the node, I've been uh, on the different nodes, doing those commands on different nodes, I can be sure that the adding of the node gets true first, and then the deletion after that. Uh, zookeepers are also reliable. So as I told you, they write, write ahead logs on the disk. Uh, they make sure the baboon gets the food on time. Uh, they, write, they do snapshots of the database. So even if like the major catastrophe would come, come and like two out of three nodes would smoke, you still have one with stuff on disk. And of course, you should probably back up that stuff on the disk also. Uh, they are also efficient, so they aim for providing you the minimal latency to access all the problems, which means that if you read, you can just connect an A node and it will respond from in memory. It's pretty darn fast. They run a uh, pretty lightweight protocol, which of course is uh, like an in-cooked plan night-ish 
quite obscure but really low overhead protocol. <coughs> They're also contention free. Uh, so if you use the zoo analogy, if you're going to tour elephants but you fall asleep while touring the elephants and someone else wants to see the pigs, the zookeeper won't wait, wait for the slow process to wake up that wants to see the elephants but decides, oh, now you're going to see pigs instead and once you wake up, you're actually looking at pigs. Uh, and it's also ambition free. So they have described it, again with the same analogy, that zookeeper should uh, take care of the animals and take care of the visitors, but they should not start delivering mail or such. So what it means to project-wise, it's pretty damn uh, small problem domain that they are uh, that is actually solving, or it's not a small problem domain as such, but it's actually like a pretty thin set of things that the zookeeper actually can do. And if you want to do more complicated stuff on that one, they actually offer on the site in their wiki these recipes, like oh, you want to do. I don't know what you could do, distributed counters. So here you could probably use this feature of Zookeeper and combine it with this feature of Zookeeper to reach out uh, to like to create your nice distributed counter, but they don't include it in the Zookeeper itself. They push the responsibility of implementing that stuff to the ones that actually knew, uh, use it. That basically means that the actual Zookeeper is pretty lean. Uh, as a, pro as a, like a project, it's a pretty limited set of th things you can do with it. So, how do you do it then? Like, uh, let's, let's say you, you bought my Java pro process hype, you want to spin up your three, four hosts, you put on your zookeeper on those, they consume half of your available memory into the heap of JVM, uh, that happens. And then you're like, well, I want to use it. Well. If you're an enterprise guy, you're lucky. There exists a library called Curator, made by Netflix or Java. Uh, that's pretty damn good library for Zookeeper. It actually covers most of the recipes they have introduced in their wiki. They have implemented even some more on top of that. It, it, it's kind of like all the batteries included thing. Uh, the only problem is it's a Java library, and we're not really interested about that, right? So. Of course, <laughs> there's seven different libraries, and this doesn't even include the one that ships with Zookeeper. Uh, so you could actually say like, oh, there's eight different libraries. So yeah, there's one that ships with Zookeeper, which has been forked, and we have now this thing called CK Python, which is a fork of that. Now, that's a nice library. A year ago, when we started working it, like. We were looking at, oh, yeah, this ships with Zookeeper, and here's a fork that fixes a few bugs on that one. So let's pick that one up because, you know, if you take the library that ships with your, uh, with your database, it probably has up-to-date drivers. You know, if they make protocol changes, that's where they reflect it first. And that probably is true, but you can't really tell it because there's no documentation. Yes. Why would you need documentation? Well, you think, oh, I'll just look at the tests of that library. It will probably tell you how you use it. No. I look into the source code of that library. It will probably, like, then I'll figure out how can I use Zookeeper with the wrapper that they send, up, send with it. And, yeah, and turns out it's the wrapper for the C bindings of the Zookeeper, which just spins up a one massive thread where it sends uh, new jobs to be executed by the C bindings against the Zookeeper cluster, which means that a year ago, the best output we got from Zookeeper using that library was basically sec faults. Every now and then, like, oh, it died. Well, okay, so and then we started looking at, like, what else there would be. I actually found the G event Zookeeper. Turned out that it was actually written by a guy in our company originally. And, well, as the name says, it's G event plus the C bindings, so it's sec faults. Then, then you have SOAP guys. They like they have their tentacles all over the place. So you have a SOAP library. Uh, it's pretty okay, but always when I see ZC something, I kind of get start itching all over the place, and I don't really want to touch it anymore. And Twitter has also done something, but like as Twitter does, it's a go code dump in GitHub, like here's our library. Last commit three years ago, go and enjoy it. We're probably not using it anymore. Uh, 
Then you have some other things like soup, and they have a, this is a bit bad font, sorry for that. Uh, you have a TX Zookeeper, which is for Twister. So basically, we had a handful of libraries that none of them really did everything we wanted. A lot of them relied on the, or basically all of them relied on the C bindings of the zookeeper, which means that if you had a bug in the C bindings, uh, you, were, you were enjoying the sec faults. But then, there came the one library to rule them all. And with the disclaimer that if you're using t Twisted, you should probably stick into the TX zookeeper. But who uses Twisted nowadays? Kunek uh, <laughs> is gonna probably going to kick my ass when I get out of here. Uh, <laughs> There exists one library uh, to rule them all, and it's called Kazoo. So it's, it's the eighth or ninth, how, depending on how you count it, the Zookeeper library. Uh, it originates from a project called Nimbus, which was this nice cloud platform. It originally also used the, uh, the C bindings of Zookeeper, but then it came a guy called Ben Bangert who actually, he had a similar kind of talk in Python US, which I was really inspired about, uh, and took over the Kazoo project. And he thought the C bindings are uh, too uh, flaky, so he decided, like, why, why not go, like, all in with Python, like, build the bindings with native Python instead. Well, the problem was that, well, the thing he went through then is that he went to the Zookeeper uh, IRC channel sent mail and mailing us ask, asking like can someone point me the documentation of like how the zookeeper protocol actually works and he didn't really get any answers it's like yeah you know look the source code so what he ended up doing uh, when he took over the Kazoo project uh, he ended up doing like a, going through all the Java code for zookeeper figuring out how the protocol works and while doing it actually got asked by the Java guys, or the Yahoo guys, that could you please document your process? You know, we don't even know the protocol, so if you have like an overall view of how things move, could you please document it? But anyway, after all, he managed to implement the whole Zookeeper protocol in Python. Uh, it's not too difficult protocol, so if you actually look in the Zagasu source code, you can see how simple the protocol it is, but it took for a while for him to actually collect it all together. Uh, and uh, so, so then he actually managed to create this uh, one true library to rule them all. That's why I kind of view him as the Sauron of Zookeeper, which is kind of bad connotation on it, but the Frodo was the kind of uh, this high, arrogant kid who threw perfectly good ring into the fire. He kept the perfectly good ring and, you know, keeps on taking over the world. And he wrote, he actually, well, the Kazoo actually grew into the point that now Zookeeper who have their own Python bindings actually recommend using Kazoo instead. So if you're going to do Zookeeper, please uh, do stick to this, li uh, do this one library. Uh, also, added bonus, the Kazoo works with Python 3. It works because it's pure Python, it also works with PyPy. Uh, it uses SOAP interfaces, but yeah. You know, you have to give up something. Uh, and overall, the code quality is pretty nice. It's pretty easy to implement new features and stuff like that. And it hit 1.1 about well, a few weeks ago, I think, actually. So the 1.1 came out. Now they actually have a version of it that they guarantee that the KPI should be stable and so forth. So yeah, but let's talk a bit more about it. So how do you actually use it? Uh, it's a, you know the CRUD, uh, who knows the acronym? Who? So create, read, update, delete. So it's basically that what the CASU does. Uh, of course, but this is like reading documentation out loud to you guys, so try to hang, uh, hang in there. Uh, one thing the CASU does is it actually creates a pretty nice Pythonic API to work with the uh, Zookeeper. So you can see here, oh, I want to connect to a host running Zookeeper, so I just do uh, from Kazoo client, import Kazoo client. There exist different kind of clients, like if you run GM and so forth. And you give it a host, say start, it connects, and so everything works like a, as you would assume so. All of this stuff, like whole Kazoo, also works in async manner. 
So if you run Tornado, uh, if you run, uh, well, even if you run G-Event, uh, you can actually use the async interfaces to like fire up calls and then check, you know, if they have completed later on. I, especially if you like Tornado, it uh, seems to be very well fit into that that stuff. And but that's not all. You can actually give multiple hosts to it. This is which I think is a slight abomination, uh, like concatenating strings and separating them with comma, is actually how actual Zookeeper does it too, so they have left some uh, resemblance to the Zookeeper itself. So yeah, you can actually give like a list of hosts, it picks one of the random connects to that one. It even gets better, I'm like a sales guy here. And you can even give like a namespace for, for your uh, hosts that you connect into, and that makes sure that when it connects to the cluster, it actually creates your own personal namespace. It's like a CH-rooted environment where you can be sure that no one else is tinkering around with your data unless they connect with the same namespace. <coughs> yeah, but that's fairly simple. So you want to create your node. Boom. You have your client. You say create your Python, give some binary data, 2013 to it. Zookeeper happily writes it there. So now when you run this one, what actually happens is that your client has connected to one of the Zookeeper nodes in your cluster. You do, you say create, uh, you send the data over to the node, like, ah, I want to write this node. Uh, your, the node in the cluster ask must, asks the master node, like, ah, you want to, you know, I have this data here, I'd like to write it, and the master says, like, yeah, it should be okay. And then they do this Paxos negotiation, which, like, goes over my head, uh, with other nodes, send like confirmation up, and after quite a chatty thing between the clusters and cluster nodes, you get back re reply that, yeah, your write was successful. So that's also one reason why you don't probably want to pour loads of data into Zookeeper, because the more you put there, the more chatty the cluster gets, and more, you know, even though it's fast, but if, like, if you start writing the one megabit, uh, megabyte limit, limit files there, or, or files or entries near the one megabyte, it gets really chatty and really slow when doing stuff. Fine. But let's say you would like to uh, write a bit different stuff. You would like to write things in the zookeeper uh, to, let's say, like, you would like to use that as a status thingy. You would like to write there something, and when your client dies, you would like it to be removed. Well, it's kind of lucky because the Zookeeper supports a thing called ephemeral nodes. So you can actually write a node in the Zookeeper and say, hey, I want this one to be ephemeral node. And Zookeeper guarantees to you that, you know, once I'm out of, Zoo out of your Python, this node no longer exists. So if your client dies, the Zookeeper will send a heartbeat every minute and say, like, oh, this session, is, this session has now died. So it'll just re silently remove this node. So you get this nice thingy of like being able to write, like, oh, these services are online. You can write status nodes all over the place. And if the service dies, the node goes away, and you have a somewhat real-time-ish picture of what's going in your cluster. In addition to that, Zookeeper also offers the sequ sequential nodes. So you want to write, uh, a, you can write like uh, sequential nodes where you give a prefix, like here, the sequential under the EuroPython folder or node. And what Zookeeper does, it, it asks the master, like, what's the biggest sequence for this directory at the moment? And then it adds this. 10-digit uh, number in the end of the node. So you can actually write, implement stuff like queues and so forth uh, using sequential stuff. And as always for this case, you can be sure that it will be ever, uh, it's probably not ever increasing because it only has 10 digits, but it will be like incremental number that grows and Zookeeper will keep track of the, uh, the nasty parts for you, like that actually all nodes agree on the order of stuff. Now, if you want to read stuff, that's pretty simple. You just get the stuff you want to see something exists. Uh, this is all pretty straightforward. You want to get all the children. You ask for one node, you get a nice backlist. So here are all the children, and then you can run more queries. If you want to update nodes, you just set your Python, your case, set, oh, you set data, nervous, done, it's there. And once you're done with your nodes, uh, it's pretty easy to delete them also. So that's all nice. But, you know, okay, what to do with this stuff? Uh, who here, let, let's just think, think in the context of one server. Who here has run, ran multiple processes on a server 
and to imply that something is running has written a lock file on disk. Ah, there you go. Who here has run into the problem of none of those processes are running, a lock file is there, and none of them is starting because the lock file is there. Ah. So, you can do a lot of stuff in it. You can do distributed locks. And it, uh, you want to distribute locks, well, you just write a lock file as an ephemeral node on the zookeeper cluster, and once either the job is done or the node is dead, the lock is gone also. You want to do barriers, check. You want to do semaphores, check. You want to do distributed counters, check. Uh, you want to do leader elections, even that's possible. But of course, a lot of this is like the nasty, you know, distributed stuff. Always some something is down or up. So, you know, how would you do this stuff? What, like, what kind of great minds you have to put into that to create nice libraries, uh, uh, create a nice tool to actually write the logs and like use it in your software? The answer is none. Because like the curator, the casu, even though it doesn't offer as much recipes as curator does, it actually offers all, all these ready-made. So, you know, you need distributed locks from casu receive import lock. Uh, you want semaphores from casu receive lock import semaphore and so forth. You get all these things covered and you don't really need to break sweat. Unless, of course, there's a bug in the library, but I haven't found one yet in those parts, but you know, you don't have to worry about, yeah, if I write this here and this dies and if this wants to do the same thing and uh, that's just important, you know, it's like the import anti-gravity kind of thing. I've been like, I've been so high with this stuff. Uh, okay, uh, what if you want to know, like, why you write stuff in the Zookeeper? What if you want to know, like, when one thing's changed? Like, let's say you use Zookeeper for configuration management. You write different configurations for nodes to pick them up, and then you want to know, like, oh, here's a new configuration. Uh, wonder, you know, how I notify my nodes that they should probably reload it. Well, in comes the thing called watchers. Zookeeper itself supports watchers, which are per client or per session, as Zookeeper calls them, connections. Uh, per session, like the watchers that you can register on different things. So. When you uh, check if a node exists, you can actually set the watcher function for it in Kazoo. Uh, that gets that actually goes into the zookeeper and gets registered in the zookeeper that when this node either changes, is being created or gets deleted, you get notified. Same thing when you get data, you can like uh, set up a watcher and the same thing. Someone creates a node, changes the node's content or deletes it, and you will get notified. Or if you want to know if someone is adding more children under uh, your Europython dinner so that you don't miss any Bistec Gala Fiorentina, you'll just set a watcher there and then when someone adds a node or removes a node underneath that node, you get no notified. Now the catch here is that Zookeeper only supports like a one-time event, so it won't support kind of a pops up kind of thing. So if you register watcher, then you know the watcher launches and you have to re-register it, hope you didn't miss that much in between, and hope, yeah, you know, the usual drill of like watching nodes and then you have to re-register when the callback launches. But fear not. <coughs> Once again, Kasu comes with awesome recipes. You just throw a decorator on your function and Kasu will like take care of like if once the watcher launches it immediately registers a new one. Sure, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of time that, you know, you might lose something, but still, it can't get really any simpler than that. And once something get, happens, you get the data that happens, you get the start of the node, or you get the list of the children. You can even get the event. Uh, I actually just patched the both watcher recipes so that you can actually get the Zookeeper event all the way through, which tells, well, where Zookeeper tells you this, was the node created, was it deleted, or what happened. So you don't even need to have any state in your software. You can just, you know, put the watcher there and let the Zookeeper tell you what's the state the state of the software. So, then there's the one more thing, because you're all good uh, developers, you also write tests, right? So you've written them beforehand. And I just want to mention just briefly, uh, Kasu actually comes with uh, like a setup and tier down functions for the, like, for testing, it even comes with the subclass of unit test test class, if that's what you rocked rock your boat, that you can actually just the subclass, <coughs> sorry, 
uh, subclass the Kazoo test case. And what it does when it enters the test case, it will actually spin up a Zookeeper cluster of three nodes on your computer. So it's pretty damn easy to run functional tests against the actual Zookeeper then and be sure uh, that your software works. But now you've covered all the documentation, you've written a nice software, and you've tested it and so what, and then something goes wrong. So what to do uh, in the case of something goes wrong? Well, the cool thing with the Zookeeper is that if you read the documentation, they kind of like underline it in like every second sentence, is that don't keep any state in your software. Now you have this new, nice distributed thing, so keep the state there, don't try to outsmart it and keep a state in your software. Just trust alone on the what zookeeper. Because if you do that, then if something goes wrong, then you can just nuke the whole thing from the orbit. You go to do like sys like, like oh I didn't want this back. You go to the sys exit and let some upstart uh, supervisor or something else to spin up your process again. Read the state from the zookeeper and continue working as nothing happened. Cool. So that's basically my intro to how to actually use Zookeeper from Kazoo. Uh, then, uh, let's talk about a bit about like how we actually use it. So, who here knows Spotify? Ah, maybe I should have asked the other way around. Who here doesn't? Who? I guess it's also like last year we launched, no, like recently we launched in like Italy and Poland, like it's probably the most frequently asked question last year, like when are you going to come into Italy? Anyway, so we have, it's a music streaming service, uh, 30 million-ish, uh, or over 30 million monthly active users, 6 million of them pay us 10 euros per month. If you, anyone, if anyone of you is paying, you can kind of view it as paying my salary or any of, any of our awesome colleagues' salary. I appreciate that a lot. I actually pay part of my own salary myself too, which is kind of weird. Uh, and I made my girlfriend do the same thing. Uh, I'm w waiting for the race. Uh, anyway, one part of this, like where I work on is, as I told you, is the index part. So we want to have the search indices uh, deployed on the clients. We have encryption keys because of the DRM. Our audio is encrypted. Uh, we want to have Basically, the like main main four indices like one is the encryption keys. One tells you where you actually find the files when you want to play them. One actually tells what the files are, like album names, artist names, track names, stuff like that. And the fourth one is the search index. Now, if you do search, but you don't have the actual album names, it's kind of like what you're going to display to the user. It's like you have to have the uh, like the index providing you the album names before users start, start doing searches against it. And if, if you see the album names, but you can't know where you find the file, or you know how do you actually open the encryption, it gets kind of hard. You end up in this state. You search for this new Justin Bieber. Ooh, there's a track. You click on it. Nothing happens. And you're like, no. And then you go to the customer support forums, and you've all seen the programming GIF, and you go like this. And you feel like like threads and threads of comp like complaining of like I tried to buy play the news Justin Bieber, it didn't work out. Your service sucks. I will cancel my subscription immediately, even though I'm not paying I'm an ad user. Anyway. Uh, uh, however, so this is what we saw, started solving. Uh, in the early days of year 2008, someone built uh, a tool to do this. Uh, they had like a huge bash script that just, you know, takes one file, takes the encryption keys, SCPs it over to the key server. Well, done. Then you take the album keys, SCP it over. And you know, this is nice and dandy when you have one data center in London and you have two boxes there. Works like a charm. Then enter 2012, we go over 150 boxes in three different data centers. Now we're over, uh, over 200 boxes uh, in the four data centers. One of them is always down. And you know, if you have this mile long bash script, do you think it actually can do some sort of retry logic or handle quorums or do parallel stuff? Not really. So it kind of started hitting the brick wall. So every time we had like some server down, the whole, whole thing stopped there. We had to go manually restart the script. It did it its magic again and so on and so on and so. So at that point we decided like we have to figure something else in here. And what we did is that we actually took Zookeeper 
we wrote tiny Python agent on all the service hosts because they might be running Java or uh, they anyway they're written by someone else, someone else than our team. So we wrote this tiny Python zookeeper agent on those hosts, and it has two main functions. One is that it ri writes an ephemeral node on the zookeeper cluster saying, "Hey, I'm alive, and I'm running this version of the index now." So we get like a nice status, status view of like what nodes are alive in the cluster and what, which one of them are down. Then the other one is that it starts watching this tiny deploy node. And the only thing we, can, we just do is that we write there from uh, our like, uh, main index serving machine, we write like, uh, hey, there's a new index available for services of these types. And please consider this order of upgrading when you download it. And we write it there. The watchers in the agent launch, they're like, ooh, new index, how oh, fancy, new music. They download the whole thingy from there. Then they use the sequential node to put themselves in the queue. And then the first guy in the queue just goes like, oh, I'm the first one. I shall load the new index. And then the next guy and the third guy. And once all those have done it, uh, once you reach some sort of quorum, uh, the next service, which is depending on the previous service, just starts working. And it's kind of complicated. I can explain more of it if you're interested. Uh, or really, it's not that complicated, but I can draw like boxes and arrows on paper if you're more interested about it. But the thing is that actually using the zookeeper as a backend instead of going for, for your own gossip protocol or adding more retries into your code, it actually became pretty easy for us to just, you know, define this like an uh, order of dependencies, define quorums, define parallel stuff, and it's actually writing, uh, working out pretty well. Though, a small disclaimer, we're not using it for all the services yet, so we are doing gradual rollout because there's other people involved. I don't just want to go there and like push soft on the service and like smile like, eh, I didn't know what I did. Uh, so, yeah, we are actually now rolling out the whole thing incredibly, and only thing I wish that I wish that I would have found the Kasu before. And we wasted around six months around the CK Python, like sick faults and weird APIs, like where you actually want to see how you use something. You go see the Python bindings, there's no code there. You see the C library, there's nothing in there. But there's no documentation or whatnot in there. You go see the Java documentation, then you do like this. Yeah, this Java parameter probably is that integer that we pass to the C. And it, when you look at Java code, source code, like, oh, you want to pass that integer around. Anyway, uh, lo like only if we would have known that six months ago, we might have actually been done with this already. But it's a fun project to work on anyway. Uh, so. Just to recap the whole thing, uh, please do not be afraid of Zookeeper. Yes, it's a Java thingy. Yes, it runs a JVM. It hogs all your memory when you start it. Uh, it's in it's in memory database, so you have to have some memory on your on your service because if you fill that up, there's a Zookeeper. It doesn't do anything like I just write part on the disk. It wants everything to be in memory. But if you treat it well, if you only give tiny piece of chunks of data to it if you use it for configuration hand locks and stuff like that and don't try the world like write the whole world in it. It actually serves you pretty damn well. And if you start using uh, if you do like us said that if you use it from Python, you free, feel free to look in the other libraries and or if you run the twist that take the DX zookeeper, but otherwise go for Kazoo because it is the most recent library. Uh, it's also used by Mozilla, us, I think Discus uses it. So there's a lot of traction behind it, and they're cranking new versions out as fast as they can. And of course, you didn't see that one coming, uh, because I don't know Zookeeper that well. I would like to have someone on board who actually knows it pretty damn well. I also want to have more Python guys, uh, mainly because like around two years ago, we hired most of the Oracle in Stockholm, like the JVM guys, you know, not like, not like guys who write Java, like we hired the guys who write the JVM. I, I, I sit next to this wizard, you know, it's like, ah, well, did our Java process be slow? And he's like, yeah, just add like plus XX, print GCD. He can actually remember probably all the command line flags for JVM out of his memory. And then I try to battle these guys, I have this nice dynamic language. He's like, Bleh. 
So I, I want more Python guys so we can take over those Java overlords. Uh, I, want, I, want, I want people who know Zookeeper so we can actually show them that we are better with Java than you are, because he only knows the JVM, but maybe we have to turn to him when we run out of memory. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you all. You mentioned 150 nodes and three data centers. Yeah, and like well, it's 200 in four now. Kind of. So how many of them? Well, I mean, how many zookeepers are you running? And we we currently what's run. The setup? Oh, okay. So we currently. That is a good, good question. We currently run three uh, instances per site. I would kind of like to grow it to five because now we, when we have three instances, it means that one of them go, can go down, or we can have a network partition cutting one out, and two of them still work. But I would like to go for five because then you could actually lose two nodes and things would still run fine. But so far with three nodes, we haven't had uh, much of like we haven't had mo any problems with actual amount of nodes. The biggest problem we've had so far is that we had one flaky node that went up and down, and every time a node goes down, the zookeeper kind of starts this election process to figure out who's the new master. And when you have one node going up and down, you kind of saturate the network between the nodes pretty easily. And are they dedicated machines for Zookeeper? And how, how is, is there like a super machine with like half a terabyte of RAM or... I no, mean, no, no. How they bad are, is it? No, no, they are uh, dedicated machines with uh, 16 gigs of RAM. Because we only write tiny pieces of configuration. I think like it's kilobytes what we write in Zookeeper. <laughs> so you should not like cram there all the data. It's just like configuration information and status information and stuff like that. I write there. More questions? So how, how did you become so convinced that Zookeeper is the, the right thing to use, even though the Python bindings were so sucky? I mean, well, six months is quite, quite a lot of time to look for other options. Is there nothing comparable? Uh, uh, that's a, another good question. Uh, that was because we had this one guy in our team who were actually was uh, one of the core, uh, had actually, uh, he had actually has a commit access to Hadoop uh, in Cloudera, the, to the Cloudera's Hadoop stack, and he knew Zookeeper well. And we decided, like, okay, we have the problems of the bindings, which means that we had to put some time effort on working on those, but we also had the knowledge of the Zookeeper in house. Uh, back then, uh, he now actually works at Cloudera, which is a shame. Uh, so that's why we decided to stick to the Zookeeper. And Zookeeper itself didn't seem to have that much issues, so more, of, more or less we had to just work around the bindings until we found out Kasu later on. More questions? Um, hey, uh, besides the fact that, or what you show about watching for changes and yeah. you know, all that, uh, Functionality for all the other things. I, uh, is there anything really useful that you could get from Zookeeper compared with I don't know any other place where you could store centralized stuff? Like I mean, if you have a race instance, you throw your configuration that you need to then read later somewhere else. You can just do it with one race instance and that's it, right? But I, I don't see any further functionality that you would get. Well, the, the, fun the main functionality that we get is that we avoid the problems of like the, what, what Zookeeper brings to us. Like, uh, yeah, these are simple examples, but the whole thing is pretty simple. So you write nodes and they have data or not, and you have a few different node types. But the biggest thing, things we have that if we want, when, when we want to build queues that involve tens of machines, we can be sure that someone else takes care of all the Paxos magic, all, all like. Uh, all the complicated stuff, so to say, under the surface. And we can be sure that we also have not only one box doing a configuration, but we have three boxes, and we can afford one of them going down and still be guaranteed that we have consistent data on those two boxes. So it is, uh, we, we could do this with the one, only one instance, but that would lead to problems like uh, if that goes down, then it would be a, like a single point failure. We could take some other database that does replication, but they usually come with like a single master setup or 
or the other way around, you have a multi-master setup, but they push the conflict, uh, conflict handling to you or do something obscure. And the zookeeper's approach is like, if it can't figure out what to do, it just won't do it. And uh, that's been like a main reason for us to outsource the hard distributed parts outside. Though they are nice parts to work on, I don't say that one, but uh, I kind of prefer not thinking about Paxos algorithms all day long. Um, so if Zookeeper gives you this nice central authoritative view of the state of your cluster, which node is up and in which state, uh, how would you connect that to some sort of round robin, like say HA proxy, uh, which would usually take care of its health information on its own, which would then be redundant? Do, do you use that for that use case at all? Uh, no, we don't. We don't have a, any proxies, but I would say, like in those cases, you probably. Probably HA proxy has some way of notifying outside. Like if you can get the state from it, you can probably write that in Zookeeper. But also there, there exists projects that kind of include what Zookeeper provides in themselves. Or so you could use Kazoo to write uh, like a hook between HA proxy and yeah, uh, Kazoo, likely. right? Yeah. yeah. And then you could use the whole like Zookeeper cluster to have like an overall state of your system, yeah. which is also one of the benefits we get. Like we get this monitoring view. We just look into the one data center, see the cluster there, and it shows you like how the what's the system state at the moment. So I was wondering when you had your three data centers, do you how do you actually kind of deal with the um, the configuration between each, are they independent or is there some kind of replication? No, we don't. So uh, one thing is Zookeeper is that because it's, it's pretty chatty. Uh, they, like for Zookeeper, the recommendation is that you run it in one data center and one data center only, preferably in like close proximity network location too, uh, just to avoid like congestion in your network by the Zookeeper chat. Uh, how we solve the things, how we actually have built our whole backend is that we assign users to different data centers, and all the data centers contain all that the, those users need. So we don't actually need cross data center communication. But of course, that means like when we push new indices, we have to signal every Zookeeper index in all those four data centers differently that now load these, and then they will work in parallel. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't do cross data center stuff with Zookeeper. It's too chatty for that, and prefer to avoid it. Anybody else? More questions? No? This one. So, oh, sorry. Thank you for the talk. I was about to call my own Paxos implementation, so <laughs> thanks. Uh, I'm interested in the election, uh, leader election, uh, recipe. Are you using that? Uh, is it actually using the actual Paxos election protocol to work with your client? No, we don't actually. No, we don't. That was one example of like uh, stuff you have in, uh, in the recipe. So I haven't actually used election stuff myself. Right. right thank you. Yeah. yeah but it for the video for with the mic. Well, while you work the work there, uh, I actually have a few colleagues here. If you want to ask like us more questions, there's. Like so speaking here. about the database layer, I assume you have uh, you, you are doing some sort of sharding or something and if there are a few database machines, uh, how, how do you use somehow use a zookeeper to coordinate uh, those or they are kind of uh, kept behind some facade interface? Uh, we don't <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry to ruin your question, but we don't actually do sharding. Uh, okay. We, we, we are, uh, we do like for humongous amount of data, we use Cassandra. Uh -huh. But that's, uh, that's not my expertise. Uh, there might be, uh, I think, Par, Par there, there might know about Cassandra. May, if he doesn't know, I just, you know, for those of questions on here, he doesn't know. He's just watching his iPhone. Uh, uh, we don't do sharding in this data. So like, for example, search indices, they still fit in the memory. And if we would do sharding, then we would probably just run one. Okay, on the there is no such a problem. Yeah. Okay, I see. Thanks. We we had the luxury of like uh, not 50 percent, but tens of percent of our catalog never being played, so we can you know just leave a lot of stuff on the disk, and no one will ever ever find them out if they are lying on the disk. You don't have to fit them in memory necessarily. Okay. So we're done. 
Okay, thank you very much.